My name is Tyler Vasquez, and I'm here with Father Ed Murphy on October 21st, 2020. This interview is part of the Catholic Institutions of North Central Florida Project with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, can you start off by telling me a little bit about your personal life? Um, what led you to become a priest and eventually what led you to work with St. Patrick's Church in Gainesville? Gainesville, Florida, and I went to the major universities, and then after that I I worked for about a year, and then I went to seminary about 1984. I studied at two seminaries, St. Meinrad uh, Seminary in um, St. Mine, Indiana, and then also St. Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary in Boynton Beach, Florida. Um, I, I took a year of leave of absence for about a year or two, and then I was ordained in 92 uh, by Bishop um, John Snyder, um, May 9, 1992. And my first assignment was at St. Patrick's in uh, Catholic Church as the uh, parochial vicar under Father Roland Julian, who was pastor at that time. So my vocation uh, really stems from a life uh, of uh, discernment uh, with being exposed to Catholicism. My, my, my family was very devout Catholics. Um, uh, we went to church every Sunday, sometimes on the weekdays as well. I used to serve as an altar server. And, and I remember um, as a young man, this is something I distinctly wanted to do. I mean, there were other times I decided in college I wanted to do maybe engineering. Um, but um, other than that, no, this is this was really my calling. I, I felt very good. And and so, my like I said, I came to St. Patrick's and, and uh, it, was, uh, June of, it, was, it was June of 1992. So you were pretty set on becoming a, a, a father from... Yes. Pretty, from a pretty early age. Fairly, yeah, fairly. But I mean, I, they, you know, things changed uh, in high school and college. And there were, you know, I did dabble around the idea of becoming an engineer, getting married and all this stuff. But uh, the, the vocation was always there in the back of my heart and my mind. And, and I, I credit that a lot due to my exposure to a lot of good priests who had a, a highly good influential uh, impact on me. And also, I went to a Catholic college called Christendom College. After I left Georgia Tech, I went to Georgia Christian College in Virginia, and that made a huge impact on my vocation. You know, I studied a lot of Catholicism, a lot of theology and philosophy, and so it uh, had a major impact on my vocational decision. Okay. Um, many of the people that we've interviewed for this project, project have actually uh, mentioned Father Julian. Uh, how did you know Father Julian, and can you tell me a little bit more about him and um, his work with the church? What you did with well, I got to meet Father Julian more so after I got ordained. I'd heard about him. I've met him, you know, personally, but never really got to know him until I got ordained um, to uh, the parish. I was very glad to work with him. And he was a very astute man. Um, you know, Father Roland it was a very quiet man, gentle man. Um, he um, just uh, worked. He was, he was like your best friend working with Father Julian. I was there for four years under his uh, leadership before I, tran before I was transferred. So it was great. It was good working with him. A very, very nice gentleman. We had a great friendship. And I was not the only priest there. There was a Father Paul Donnelly, was the other associate. He had been there for a while. And Father Paul um, would end up uh, getting cancer. He would later on, a number of years later, would end up passing away due to cancer. But we were all like, all three of us were very good friends. You know, we've worked together very well. Uh, are you still in contact with any of the people that you worked with at St. Patrick's Church? Or maybe any? Yes, well, I, 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 there was a, a, a funeral there about a month or so ago of a parishioner that I've known for many, many years um, since I first got there. And the, the woman passed away. So I ran into a lot of people at the parish that I, that I know very well. So in, in fact, I keep up with a lot of people in social media. I talked to Father Julian. Uh, I also ran into a number of priests that were his former associates, uh, associates there. Father, uh, uh, what is it? Um, I forget his name. Uh, excuse me. And, and so there was a lot of other people that I that I knew. I saw there for a long time. Pendergraph, Father Michael Pendergraph, is is another form, one of his former associates there that would happen to be at the funeral. So you know, I've seen a lot of people uh, there that I had known. I do keep it like in touch with a number of them. Okay, and um, what was the perception or reputation of St. Patrick's Church in the community of Gainesville when you um, were affiliated with them? What was their role in the community? I guess that's a better question. Well, well 
St. Patrick's um, had a school, it was called Interparish School. Uh, the parish at that time um, was starting to grow. It was in, an, it was in the northeast section of town. Um, the, uh, you know, it was, it was a very good, a lot of, it was an old parish. There were a lot of old parishioners that had been there for generation after generation. And there were some new families starting to come in. However, when they started experiencing a building boom to the west of Gainesville, especially with Queen of Peace and over in the southwest <clears throat> sector of town, uh, we started seeing some parishioners gravitating over to that side of town. Um, and so we remained stable for a number of years. It wasn't a, a it was a very, it was a very, uh, I say, strong community, very close knit. We did a lot of, um, uh, had a lot of community things that we did together, a lot of parties. Um, I was vocally trained, so I sang, you know, for a lot of different things and parties that we had and events. I was very also much involved with the school at the time, and I would teach and go over there and uh, work with the kids, and I involved in the sports activities of the church, uh, of the parish, of the school. So I knew of all of the school parents, all the children. I trained the altar servers, uh, just very much involved, involved with the Knights of Columbus Council there. Uh, a number of different events happened there, but, and uh and one of the uh, apostles that I was also involved was working with the hospitals. At that time, Alachua General Hospital was around. I would go and visit that frequently, and also the nursing homes around there, so the, and the homebound sick. So there, were just, there was a lot of stuff to do, um, but it was a very dynamic community, and everybody knew, knew everybody. You know? uh, would you say once um, development sort of started around the church, uh, did the demographics change at all? You said that it was... Um, uh, well, I mean, it it was more middle income uh, uh, families. Uh, the the really we we had some people that were coming from the western part of the city. Um, and they would come because of their association with the school. The school was a big magnet for them. But then when uh, Queen of Peace Academy was built, uh, Queen of Peace Parish, and they built their academy, we lost a lot of students. Uh, that began going over there because basically they're, they're raising their families on that side of town. So once Queen of Peace Parish and the academy got started, then um, we started seeing people dropping off because they were, you know, obviously they were traveling from that side of town over to St. Patrick's before all that to the school. And then, of course, St. Patrick's Interparish School was not was no longer the only school in Gainesville. And then along would come with St. Francis High School. Um, late, some years later, we would have St. Francis High School. What, was St. Francis High School associated with the church at all? or was Yes, that... it was a Catholic high school. Okay. I was um, involved with um, some of the steering committee. I was one of the pastors involved in the advisory board. When that particular uh, high school was, was being drawn up, I was there for the dedication of the new high school. Uh, at that time, though, however, I that was in the 2000s. I was pastor of St. Madeline's Catholic Church in High Springs, Florida. I was there for about five and a half years. But I also still was very much involved with St. Patrick's uh, Parish and School for a number of different things, especially with the school. I continued to be involved with it, even though I was now pastor up in High Springs. But there wasn't that far of a drive, so, so I got reconnected with them back in the 2000s. Uh, so it seems like you were involved um, quite a bit in the schooling aspect of, of the church. Uh, were there any other specific programs or, or perhaps like... Yes, I, I, I helped found the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Um, th this is an uh, organization which was a outreach for the poor and the destitute in the area. Uh, what they do is St. Vincent de Paul members are, are parish uh, volunteers who go out to to the homes of people that are in need of assistance with lights or let you know or uh, rent and or food assistance or some other social service that can be benefit them I, I got the idea when i was in a previous assignment up in jacksonville i uh, was, uh, was doing that and uh, so that seemed to be a great resource we were helping many families and we did that in tandem with catholic charities and uh, saint francis house as well helping these people these indigent in a special way that was very enjoyable what, what, what years did this program operate? Is it? It was about, um, the St. Vincent de Paul probably came out about 1993. I was there in 92. So probably about 93, and uh, it continued on after I left in 96. Okay. Um, and are there any other changes that um, you... Well, I remember, I remember when I was there in, in uh, between 92 and 96, 
that we built the gymnasium at the school and we dedicated the new, new gymnasium. I was there for that. And uh, so I remember that was a that was a landmark thing. Then um, years later, when I was in High Springs as pastor up there, um, they dedicated the new church uh, that Father Father Julian that that one to Father Julian that that new church that they're in now. And I forget what year that was, but I was um, there. You know when they when they dedicated the new church, it was a very beautiful church. So, but they were in the process of trying to build that thing. So. So that pretty much, I'm trying to think if there's any other highlights. <laughs> uh, there are always kinds of things that were going on. There are funny stories and different things that happened, but uh, uh, sure. it was a, it was a, it was a time, um, like, you know, it was a time of, of, of growth, excitement in Gainesville, but there were, you know, there were all people that we knew that died, passed away. And uh, there were always challenges, in, you know, in, in the parish, but uh, it was good. I, I really enjoyed my time, my four years there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when you say it, it was a time of growth, do you feel as though you grew as a Catholic? Do you feel like you grew um, as a as a practitioner of the faith? And you know, how did working with the church impact the way that you viewed Catholicism? Or well, <clears throat> as the years go by, with all the challenges that that we as priests deal, I think um, there's always growth, and you know, you have to use those opportunities. I mean, there were times when. I dealt with some difficult problems and stuff, and, and of course, Father Julian being, was a good mentor, and he helped me through s- some problems and difficulties that I experienced in my pastoral ministry there, so I grew in that. I made mistakes, and you know, I had my share of mistakes when I was there. I, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I tried to reach out as to many families as I possibly could, but you know, sometimes I may not always been politically correct in certain things, and you know, that might have upset some people, but I felt that I that I grew in my faith and tried to learn from my mistakes and things like that. So I wasn't perfect, you know. Um, but I have some very fond memories of the people there, the people that um, I just enjoyed their friendship and going. You know, so many of the parishioners opened up their homes for dinners. I'd go over there and hang out. I had a friend, of, a parishioner that I used to play tennis with regularly, and uh, his home was always a you know, open home. I could go and you know, I had the Knights of Columbus. They had their swimming pool. Uh, and club, they had their, uh, their house, I mean, their meeting uh, hall uh, off of 23rd, and I'd go over there a lot for you know, swimming or meet up with the Knights, and other families would gather over there. Uh, There's just so many different things and activities that took place, um, this, uh, you know, and also school uh, stuff that was going on, like parties and celebrations. They was always inviting me, you know, and wanting me to give unvocations for everybody. I had a talent show, we had a talent show, which I I, I uh, danced with a young lady, a young, one of the students, and um, uh, from the, the the theme the theme movie uh, Annie, you know the the, Broch, the sh- you know, Broadway show. I did I sang a little dance with that. That was very funny, uh, but just a lot of good, wonderful experiences of the friends that I made, lifelong friends. You know, so it's just very very good. I, I grew in my priesthood because I, you know, it helped me to come out of myself. I was a little shy, quiet guy, but the time we got it just really helped me. Uh, I want to ask a little bit more about the um, community outreach that you were involved in at St. Yeah. Patrick's Church, and more generally, um, you, you know, what was, what do you think that the role of St. Patrick's in community building in Gainesville was? Do you think that it played um, sort of an integral role in the Catholic community in the region? Do you think that um, you made strides in in building a Catholic community in Gainesville? Well, that probably is a question that you need to ask Father Julian. I mean, he was the pastor there. I mean, he did much of that work in ecumenical relationships and also uh, working with the poor. I mean, he was on the board of directors for the St. Francis House there for many years, and he was very essential. He was, that was one of his passions. Uh, but I think that people began to realize St. Patrick's um, was a place where people uh, knew that we would try to a place of outreach. We could help people in the community, help them when they were struggling, prisoners and non-prisoners alike. Uh, uh, in terms of ecumenic relationship, definitely, I think we were on the forefront. Uh, that was something that was very that Father Julian was very passionate about ecumenic relationship between other pastors. Some of which I, I got involved with to a certain extent, but basically that was Father Julian's baby. I mean, that's what he did. Um, 
St. Patrick's also uh, was very much involved, the people and the pastor myself involved with pro-life activities um, in the area. So, uh, so that, that was also very important as well. Okay, yeah, it seems like Father Julian was a very influential figure in the, in the church. I'll certainly have to ask more about him in the future. Um, I, I wanted to ask more generally um, about your faith and um, what, I, I guess to start with, what does Catholicism mean to you and how does your faith influence the way that you live besides the obvious, you know, your profession and your career? Well, Catholicism means universal. You know, it's, it, it, we all know that. I mean, that's a term that's derived from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was an early church martyr, and he's the one who divided Catholicism. Catholicism is a universal, is a universal church. I mean, it's, uh, and, and in my early years of priest, I had the opportunity to travel overseas and went to Rome. I met uh, Pope John Paul II, um, and uh, personally, uh, I, you know, I got to travel different places in Europe and throughout the years of my priesthood. So you get to see the universality of the church. Um, the early years of my priesthood, um, I, I began to realize that the church was not just a small world, there's a larger world out there. And you meet people with different opinions and, and, and different slants on what Catholicism is. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a much broader world than we think. Uh, I realized that the, the, the missionary field is so important. Because I've been involved in some a little bit of missionary work in in uh, southern Georgia uh, and also in Virginia, did some missionary, I say, evangelization work. So I realized that there was the, the mission field was very open at that time. Um, uh, and so I guess my take on all this is those four years that I was there, I had learned so much. I realized um, that I met so many different people be, that challenged the way I looked at my relationship with God and in the church. Challenge some of my thinking, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes we, you often hear um, the comment, we need to be a little more broad thinking, you know, thinking of some things that should like an inclusivity, uh, you know, understanding and accepting, appreciating and respecting other people's opinions. And all that, because Gainesville is a, a very interesting area. Uh, it's a, you know, they have a broad mix of political views in Alachua County, and I, I've realized that over the years, you know, living there for a number of years, it's, it's a different kind of a hodgepodge of all kinds of communities. So you have to learn to have patience and also be respectful of other people's opinions. Of it. And I think in St. Patrick's, you like, did definitely had a lot of, uh, of opinions about things. Uh, that's just the way I think. Because I came from an experience in my previous time was where people were more one-sided, you know, more traditional. St. Patrick's had its traditional aspects, but it also had some more of its more liberal aspects as well. So it was a hodgepodge of different things. Do you think um, Gainesville is unique in that respect? Have you found like a similar experience working well, at St. Patrick's? Leon County, and of course, FSU was like that, University of Miami, other, everywhere you go to where there's a major university, or university towns tend to be more, um, more, I say, a word is not dynamic, but more, uh, hodgepodge uh, of things you know you have between extremes you know uh universities tend to be a little more all bent on more liberal causes rather than conservative causes uh, because of the influence of the university um so i i when i came to gainesville i didn't at first i was like surprised at uh, some of the viewpoints people express uh coming out of uf uh, but they but i began as time i began to understand where they're coming they're thinking on this a lot of people are concerned Especially Alaska County, they were concerned about social justice issues, you know. And I understand that. I, I understand where they were coming from. I didn't always agree their slant on it, but uh, but that's basically the premise. And, and a lot of the university students, well, here's another thing. I didn't have that much interaction with the university student. That was the student center, that uh, St. Augustine Center, that at uh, the time Father Gillespie was there with Father John Phillips and Father Tim Lozier. Uh, they were at the time, and they were more involved in the university. But every once in a while, they would come over to say mass uh, at um, St. Patrick's for the school kids. So because St. Patrick's was an inter-parish school, meaning that it wasn't just St. Patrick's that had control um, over the school. Other parishes as well had a say-so uh, because many of their, their par many of their parishes had their kids going to St. Patrick's at the time. So it was a 
that's the kind of thing. So you had a mix of different people involved with the parish. Uh, so, so you mentioned that um, social justice is um, kind of an uh, issue that college students are, are interested in. Uh, do you feel as though St. Patrick's Church living in a college town or residing in a college town was also somewhat concerned with social justice issues? Do you think that connected with their community well, outreach? They would, yes, yes and no. Yes, in one sense, they were aware of some of these issues. There was a group of people that, you know, were concerned and were involved. And there's a lot of them that were just, the old time parishioners had been there for generation. That, that they, you know, they said, that's great, you know, it's wonderful, but, you know, their concern was the sacraments, the church life and all that stuff like that. The, the, again, the, the, the problem is, is that, <clears throat> again, we didn't have that many UF students. We had some that would navigate over to St. Patrick's for what they would consider a more traditional service, I guess. Uh, they, you know, um, you get that every once in a while. But most of them were families with young kids and then the older senior citizens. You had a few middle-aged, but mostly you get the mixture of uh, older families and old establishment, and then you have a lot of the families that had kids, some who were in grammar school, a lot of them in high school. Uh, that began to change as the years went by uh, <clears throat> with the parish. Also, I noticed economically that there uh, they were starting to be a decline in the northeast sector of town. Uh, the old, it started to get a little more poor in that in that area. Whereas the south, the south, or I should say the west and the southwestern part of um, uh, Gainesville is more affluent. You know, you see, you see so the kind of the development started moving to the west. So uh, I, you know, I, I noticed that the parish got older. A lot of families had been there for years again. And, and then, of course, as time went on after I left, many of those families have passed away. And some of their, you know, some of their families replaced, some others didn't. Some people moved away. But um you still have a, a, a you have a group today, a lot a, a, a few people that are part of that old the old parish that have been there for since night uh, for for decades, and then uh, there's a number of people that now are part uh, that came in the last maybe the last 15 years or whatever uh, that are new to that parish, so it's a different dynamic. But there's a lot of old still a lot of old families that I know there. They remember me. Uh, you mentioned earlier that. Um through your travels to Europe and through practicing in different churches that you've come across a, a diversity of thought. Um, I guess more generally, more broadly, do you think that the role of the church um, should be to try to incorporate a diversity of opinions, or do you think that it should take a more traditional um, approach to scripture? Or, Well, I tend to be more traditional, um, and, and sometimes that rubs certain people the wrong way, particularly in the Gainesville area. But a lot of people are wanting to know the black and white truth about the faith. Okay, that's 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 the the big thing going on right now. People want to know what the church teaches in regards to uh, in, in the Catholic faith. Um, there's a general and and I, I've always been wanting to in, in my lectures and my adult for, faith formation, my catechesis. I always teach people what the church teaches and why it teaches. I I really in embrace well i should say i don't i don't really necessarily get uh, i'll get into a discussion of some of the more liberal views that are being expressed today uh <clears throat> um in discussion with certain people but i always take the tact of church's teaching why because a lot of our young people today a lot of our millennials really don't know what the church teaches well, that's, a, that's a problem a lot of that deficit comes from the lack of um uh, parental teaching because you know, parents can i tell people that are getting the babies baptized. Remember, you parents are the teachers of your children in the ways of faith. You're the first teachers. Don't just think that we catechists and priests uh, are the only ones teaching your children. And, and so there's a major deficit among many of our millennials who call themselves Catholic, uh, who don't know what the church teaches. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and a lot of times in the major universities, what I'm finding is a lot of these people are getting sucked into political movements um, uh, that uh, they claim are relevant for our time, but a lot of political movements that are whose whose goals are diametrically opposed to what the church teaches. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of that going on today, and they're getting sucked into. I call it the cancel culture, 
who have no regard for history or you know that cancel culture is very very prevalent today you know so as and it's becoming an art an anarchist movement you see the rise of anarchy and, and all kind of stuff like that that all is a result of people who uh, are really uh, in, in major university towns that really don't um, understand the roots and the history and the the beauty of, I mean, sure, there's ugly parts of our history, but other than that, I think, uh, that, you know, the history is has rich and different things, but there's what's called historical revisionists. Historical revisions are people who try to revise history and try to change it and really what it was. You know, historical revisionism is, is also a big problem. It's part of the cancel culture. Um, so again, the church is, is in the midst of all this and it's having to navigate through some very tricky waters today. I mean, it, it, it can be tricky for a priest uh, today, especially in the political atmosphere we're in right now. Mm. So, yeah. so with how much faith is changing today and how much it's um, um, altering, um, what do you think are some of the specific challenges that priests face? The specific challenge right now, as we speak, as we speak, speak right now, is with the election because people are divided, you know, and people are at each other's throats on that, that issue. Second thing, things that are coming out, coming out of Rome. Um, I don't know if you just heard, but uh, something came out of Rome uh, through the Catholic News Agency that the Holy Father is endorsing the same-sex unions. Um, right. that's, the big, that's the thing that's blowing up right now on Facebook, social media, and news. And we're trying to figure, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to sort that out and find out what, what the, if it's an authentic statement or not. That's the thing. But uh, there are there are a variety of subjects um, that Catholics are are arguing over um, uh, in this world that we live today. But the political climate is very very acrid, very hostile, and uh, and also in combined with the civil unrest and the the Black Lives movement and the Antifa and all kinds of stuff, this is causing so much disturbance of people. And it depends on what parish you're in. Uh, most parishes. Um, in the major cities, uh, like here in Northeast Florida, tend to be a little more on the traditional side. Uh, that's where it is. Gainesville would be more on the, they're very divided. You know, you have a politically divided there. Um, they're a little more open to more radical ideas, whereas here in this part of the diocese, I'm in, I'm in the St. Augustine area, uh, it tends to be more conservative is what it is. So, so But the issues, <clears throat> there's a lot of issues that people are concerned about right now. And, um, and it, it, and it's very, it can be very tense. And of course, the COVID pandemic, as you know, doesn't make it, make it any better. Uh, people are upset about the uh, uh, face coverings, social distancing, all that kind of stuff. And it's scared people from coming to church. So that's more of the stuff that's going on today, you know. Of course, you didn't have to worry about that back in 92. <laughs> right, right. I can remember the churches being crowded, you know, because I remember it wasn't long ago when the churches were crowded. Yeah. Mm. You know. So do you think that um, the COVID-19 pandemic in, in particular has kind of affected um, the Catholic community? Do you think yeah. it'll... Yeah. Well, uh, in, in two different ways. In the negative way, yes, it is. An, I call it the antisocial virus because its main goal is to keep us away from each other okay that's what it is yes it is a disease it, it can't it, and, and, and there's a there's strong there's strong components of it that can kill but i i again like the incidences of, of getting the virus are much less than getting the general flu that we get every year however having said that it is it is anti social but the good part of it is okay but the good part of it is that the people that are coming to church are the ones who uh, want to be there, and they're not gonna be intimidated by any virus. You know? uh, even though now the obligation to go to mass on Sundays and whole day's obligation has been lifted, you have people that are going to church out of, um, out of love for Jesus, you know? So, and, and, but you know, it, it has hurt our collections. All the parishes have been hit by this, and this challenged a lot of people's faith. But, um, and it's been challenging. It's been challenging for all of us. Uh, all of us priests, you know, we're we're being challenged by it because it can be depressing. I can remember when we had the shutdown back in the spring, and you're sitting in your rectory and you can't barely hardly do anything. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I found I found work to do. I studied and all that kind of stuff. But I did find ways to minister to people. You know, visit the sick. And those are shut in. Um, you know, gave communion to those who want to commune at the church. You know, so. Even though we didn't have service, we we have we, we did we televised those things, 
uh, the, our Sunday masses um, virtual, so that people can watch mass on t you know on the on the internet. <clears throat> so. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I for you, um, what do you look for when you're choosing a church to uh, aso affiliate with? Well, you know, what do you look for in a in a Catholic? Well, it, it, again, everybody has. I mean, how you was it? Everybody has a different take on what they're looking. But today, the people that are looking for a church are the ones who want to be in church. Okay. It's much, it was before the pandemic, it was people who are just looking for a church to be able to fulfill an obligation. There's a lot of those, but you have people that are looking for a community that fits sometimes their political views. I hate to say that, but some people do that. They, they want to find a church that is either more progressive or more traditional or mainstream. Okay? Uh, we, our, the parish I met is more uh, uh, traditional. And uh, so people like that. They like to, a lot of the older couples like it. Some of the young families like that. Uh, they come to that. Um, but uh, to, be, to be perfectly honest with you, if you were to put that question out to the general populace um, of churchgoers, there would be some that would say, no, when I go to church, I look for an inclusive community. Now that word inclusivity means it's loaded. It's a loaded term. It means different things to different people. Um, uh, or some, or people, I look for a welcoming community. I mean, I think we are a welcoming community. You know, we have a beautiful church here. St. Patrick's was that way too. It was a very welcoming. We had greeters. Uh, we had very, you know, people smiling faces, and they were happy to see everybody came in because it was like a family. We have sort of a family atmosphere here too as well. There's a lot of, let, there's a lot of things that I learned when I was at St. Patrick's that I brought with me in other, my other parish assignments throughout the years. But I've been I've been in parishes with very cold environments, in, in large parishes where it took a long time to get to know people. Sometimes, a lot of times, um, these these large parishes are with retirees. Some of them are not that friendly, you know? you know. And so I had to do I had to get really involved with the parish families in those large parishes. But uh, but when I look back at St. Patrick's, it was a smaller parish, but it was a very dynamic community, and we, we just. We were all family. If someone got sick in the parish, he said, please pray for so and so on. Everybody, oh, how are they doing? You know, we'd always people asking, how is so and so doing? Uh, I went through a period where I got sick uh, from, um, I, had a, <laughs> I had a kidney stone and was hospitalized where everybody was worried about me. And then I, then I had some other uh, sickness that, uh, where I had to be uh, bedridden for a while there and I lost a lot of weight. And everybody was concerned about me checking up on me every day. That was very, very good. I mean, it's just nice. Some people are very concerned about my well-being. Um, and um, so just uh, just incredible, incredible things. It, it, like you said, people um, in every parish, uh, they, they're they looking, I think they're looking for the sacred, and they're looking for community, they're looking for fellowship. They're, they want a pastor, a priest who is a leader, a pastor who is a shepherd, who cares for their flock. You know? Someone that really cares is concerned about souls and reaching out to them. I think those things all are really important. Uh, a lot of times people are looking for a priest that can preach very, very well. You know, it's got a great, uh, uh, can, that can project very well and, and it's got a very good message. And they lead them, when they lead, they challenge them to think that. And, and my whole philosophy in preaching is to challenge people. I don't do it to please people. I do it to, I don't say the things that people want to hear. I say the things that they need to hear. There's a big difference, you know. But that's how I look at it. You know, I, was like, right. I did that when I was at St. Patrick's. I only preached things I felt that people need to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so then, do you think that some of those things are what brought you to Corpus Christi now in St. Augustine? What brought me to Corpus Christi? I see. I've been I've been in a number of assignments since I left St. Patrick's. Okay, so I was I was at St. William's in Keystone Heights for about five six months. And I was there temporarily. Then I went to St. Elizabeth Seton in Palm Coast for about two and a half years. And then from there, I went to Assumption Catholic Church in Jacksonville. And I was there for about two years. And then I went to St. Madeline's in High Springs. I had two parishes, one in Brantford, two, St. Ten Juan Mission Brantford. And I was there for about five and a half years. And then I went to, um, uh, and then I went to the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in Jacksonville. I was there for 10 years. And uh, just wonderful, all diverse experience. Everything was di everything different. 
The only thing I will say is that my experience at, at uh, Corpus Christi Catholic is very similar to that of St. Miles and High Springs. Okay, uh, very similar. Uh, there's something like this. It's more like a bedroom community, what it is. We call bedroom community suburb. And uh, St. Patrick's, St. Patrick's, I would frame it as an in an in city parish uh, with a school and all that, which which provides a, a very traditional, interesting dynamic. You have people that go to church that are old time Christians. You have school parents that bring their kids to church, you know, and, and older families, younger families, stuff like that. So it's it's a it's a very uh, dynamic community. It's very that I love to it's, I love to see all the little kids. And we have kids in this parish, but when you're at some of these larger parishes, St. Patrick's and others, uh, it's just really neat to see all the children and families. Okay, um, and so tell me a little bit about your time at Corpus Christi now. What what programs or changes have you um, overseen? Well, I, I've been here since um, let's see, it was it. July of 2017. And Corpus Christi is a fairly quiet parish. Um, it was founded in 1977 by its former pastor. He was there for 42 years, so I had to replace him. And uh, being a younger man uh, in my 50s coming here, um, I, I had to solely, first of all, establish a rapport with the people. The, it's a long story behind this, but the pastor um, was asked to step down because his health was declining. And a lot of the parishioners didn't like that idea from the bishop. So I had to come in the midst of some hostility among the parishioners. But I, being that I had a broad amount of experience, and I was very successful at my previous assignment, uh, my conception, and also the fact that I already knew the pastor very well, we were friends, that was a big plus for me. So the transition was very smooth. Um, I would say that some of the some of the things that I brought to this parish um, was trying to bring uh, people more traditional values and good preaching because I couldn't understand the pastor when he preached. He was a good man, had a great message, but no one could hear him. So I was a I was much more. Dire. I brought in some more changes that needed to be done in accordance with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, for the parish to make it a little more appropriate for Sunday weekend services. I brought to adoration of the Blessed Sacrament during the weekdays, you know, throughout the day and the evening. That was a big plus for a lot of people who said that really helped their spirituality. Uh, you know, I do the rosary with everybody um, after Mass on the week, weekdays, and they, they really appreciate that. And they know I have a great devotion to the Mother of God. Um, I am uh, uh, very involved with the Knights of Columbus here. We have a women's guild. We have uh, a number of... Uh, of different organizations that work with catechetical formation for women's groups to men's groups and uh, different things that goes on here. Fellowship, youth ministry has been a very dynamic part. Well, although our number of youth are much smaller than the programs I was involved with in my previous assignment, still it was quite dynamic. We had you know programs for the elderly. Uh, we have a lot of fellowship uh, that parties and stuff like Oktoberfest, St. Patrick's Day parties. And, well, not we have all kinds of things. Uh, obviously, this year that's been mixed because of the uh, COVID. Uh, that's been a big downer. Um, and some of those programs we're no longer doing. The Knights Columbus continue to meet. The Women's Guild is not meeting. Um, there's like a couple other organizations that basically have uh, shut down indefinitely until things clear up. So that's that's a big challenge. That's those are the big challenges. So just. But it, it's, a, it's uh, like I said, the community here is, majority of it is, uh, I would say about 60%, 65% is retired, old retirees, and the rest are young families. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of your plans after, um, you know, the political, social uh, turmoil that we're kind of going through right now, Ed? Oh, you're, you're asking a very uh, nice loaded question. <laughs> it seems, seems like There's a lot. lot of unknown, but believe me, my friend. Uh, you know, and, and the weeks after this whole thing is going to be a lot of unknown. I just think there's a lot of uh, danger coming. And I think we're, we're in a very, very dangerous time right now, politically and socially. Uh, this parish, uh, I think, will still exist. You know, it's going to be very challenging. But if the pandemic continues on, which I have a feeling it will, it's going to, it's going to have a major stress factor on us and all other parishes. I'll be quite, you know, you'll be very direct with you. I'm going to tell you that it's going to, if if, um, if we continue to have to, 
endure the COVID, whether it's Trump or uh, Biden, uh, and it's, it's going to have a, a huge economic, a negative e e impact on our parish uh, in the future. Uh, it's going to keep a lot of people away. There's some people that a lot of people will not return back to church. The ones um, that either are afraid of contracting it or the ones who say, well, the bishop still is keeping it non-obligatory to go to church. So they probably will just remain, stay away. And those and their kids, you know, are we, you know, will eventually get used to the fact that we don't have to go to church anymore. You know? So we're going to lose a considerable number of people, and that's that's pretty much the the same with other parishes as well. That's going to be a challenge. So that does raise a lot of uh, issues and challenges for us as pastors. I mean, how do we how do we meet these challenges? How do we, I say, think outside the box? What we're going to have to do. We're already, we're already doing that with virtual uh, masses, online masses. That's one way we're doing it. Uh, Zoom meetings have become very commonplace. Just like today, we're having Zoom meetings. Although Zoom meetings are very effective when you're talking with someone from a distance. And now it's being used for uh, meetings where it's not you know, a good thing for us to, for people to be around each other. So uh, I use Zoom meetings for my courage ministry and other ministries that I, that I work with. I, I'm on the board for a number of diocesan ministries for the diocese, the bishop plan. So I do that stuff. A lot, a lot of those meetings I do virtually. Yeah. All right. Um, well, that's all the questions I had for you today. I, okay. Well, th anyhow, thank you so much for. Yeah. No. Th thank you for meeting up with me. I know this is a hectic time. 